Hello, I'm Linda Stein Gold, and I am thrilled today to talk about new developments in acne and rosacea. And a lot's been going on, so we have an awful lot to talk about today. I run the clinical trials at Henry Ford Health, and these are my relevant disclosures. So we know that our patients before they come to see us often go to the internet for their source of information. So is that a good idea? Are our patients getting good information? The problem is it's not always evidence-based medicine. So we have to be careful about some of the information that our patients are getting from other sources. So let's start by talking a little bit about the pathogenesis of acne and just how our mindset has changed over the course of time. We always understood that for the development of an acne lesion, we have the first step, which is the microcomedone, and that occurs underneath the skin. And from that initial step, we can develop either non-inflammatory lesions, which would be the opened or the closed comedones or the blackheads and the whiteheads, or inflammatory lesions, which are the papules, the pustules, and the nodules. But what we've come to understand is that when we actually do biopsies and study that acne-prone skin, it turns out that there's often some, some subclinical inflammation that occurs even before the development of the microcomedone. And we also find out that in that acne that's cleared up and which just leaves some residual dispigmentation or atrophic scarring, often there's also inflammation there. So we understand that the acne lesion actually potentially starts and ends much, much different than we initially thought. So now when we look at the pathogenesis of acne, we understand that the first step is subclinical inflammation and the inflammation persists even with the sequelae of acne. So we wanna be aggressive in getting that acne under control early and keep uh, treating for longer periods of time. And it's important to pay attention to that dyschromia as well because the dyschromia actually can lead potentially to the atrophic scars. When we look at the natural history of these atrophic scars, it's important to note that scarring occurs not only from just nodulocystic lesions, but also from the superficial inflammatory lesions also. So when we look at what, what lesions turn into an atrophic scar, there was an interesting study that was done a few years ago that says, you know what, it's that papule, and especially that papule that persists for a longer period of time and develops into a post-inflammatory lesion, more likely to develop into a scar. So when we think about our patients with acne lesions, we want to be aggressive in preventing scarring, even with the superficial inflammatory acne. So again, it's that dyschromia that could lead to atrophic scars. So we want to be aggressive when the acne lesions are at their peak and even when we just see the sequelae of the acne. So let's turn now to our friend Cutibacterium acnes. Is it true that if we've seen one C. acnes, we've seen them all? Well, we know from studies that if we just count the bacteria that lives in acne prone areas, including the nose, and look to see how many organisms are there in the pilosebaceous units, turns out very interesting that the number of lesions might be the same in somebody who has acne versus somebody who doesn't acne, have acne. But what's different is actually the different ribotypes that are seen. And we know, for instance, that certain ribotypes like four and five tend to be present more frequently in those patients who develop acne. This was an interesting study where they took different strains of, of uh, what was then called P acnes, which is now called C acnes, and they developed these different strains and they isolated them and they injected them into a mouse model. And what was interesting was that those strains that we associate with acne actually caused an acne-like reaction in the mouse. And those strains that tend to not be associated with acne and more associated with normal skin, it actually didn't cause the inflammatory reaction that we saw with the pro-inflammatory strains. Now we know bacteria can be kind of sneaky and one way that they like to protect themselves is to create a biofilm or a biological glue. And that can stick to the walls of the hair follicles and by gluing itself off, it can actually protect itself from antibiotics. 
And it turns out that there's certain strains of C. acnes that actually are better at forming that biological glue. And it turns out those are the strains that actually are more frequently associated with the development of acne. So now let's turn to a little bit and look at some of the treatment options. We'll start by taking a look at topical retinoids. Is it true if you've seen one topical retinoid, you've seen them all? Well, in fact, with our newer vehicle technology, that's really not the, the case. When we look at our gold standard of tretinoin, which was the first of the topical retinoids that was developed for acne, Tretinoin actually is a, is a molecule that's effective for acne, but we do know it does have an irritation profile. It turns out with this new formulation of tretinoin lotion, 0.05%, it's actually better tolerated than any of the other tretinoin formulations. When we look at tazeratine, which is also a highly effective topical retinoid for the treatment of acne, we know that tazeratine in the 0.1% is FDA approved for the cream and the gel um, for acne, but the 0.05% in the cream and gel is not FDA approved for acne. But now we have tazeratine in an even lower concentration, 0.045%. This is a lotion that actually has an enhanced vehicle. And with this lower concentration, we actually see the same efficacy that we saw with a 0.1%, but a bet, much better tolerability profile. And then finally, we have a new kit on the black block. This is triferritine. Notice the triferritine comes in a very low concentration. It's 0.005%. And why is that? Um, this, this drug was actually specifically formulated to target the RAR gamma receptor. And this is the retinoid receptor that's predominant in the skin. We need very low concentrations. That gives us a little bit of wiggle room because in the clinical trials, we studied this not only on the face, but also on the trunk. And we found that we got good efficacy and actually quite good tolerability both on the face and the trunk. So this is the first of the topical retinoids that's truly been evaluated for truncal acne. In the past, if you asked, can you use a, a retinoid on, on the trunk? A lot of people would say, no, it's just not gonna work and it's gonna be too irritating. And these triferritine studies actually proved that idea completely wrong. It does work and it is also well tolerated. Well, what about if we take our old friend topical tretinoin and combined it with benzoyl peroxide. Is it okay to use these two drugs together at the same time? Well, traditionally we know that tretinoin is not stable in the presence of benzoyl peroxide. In contrast, when we look at adapalene, which is stable with benzoyl peroxide and stable in the presence of like, light, tretinoin is actually partially degraded when it comes in contact with benzoyl peroxide and also when it comes in contact with light. So if you give your patients, for instance, a generic tretinoin that they can get and then a benzoyl peroxide, maybe a wash that they can get over the counter, they wash their face with benzoyl peroxide wash, then they apply a tropical tretinoin and then they go outside, it's a double hit and they really don't have stability of that tretinoin uh, molecule on the skin. We now, though, have a new fixed combination using a full strength tretinoin, 0.1%, which is microencapsulated, and also a benzoyl peroxide, 3%. Now, how do we get these two active drugs in one fixed combination in the same tube? And the way we do that actually is with fairly sophisticated vehicle technology. The way this drug was developed is the active drugs are actually encapsulated in a silica shell. And we have lots and lots of layers of the silica. The more layers we have, the more it reduces the outflow of the active drug. And we can have a very controlled delivery system of each of these actives onto the skin. And by encapsulating these individual drugs in the silica shell, we can actually create a stable fixed combination so they can exist within the same, the same tube. So the benzoyl peroxide is encapsulated, the tretinoin is encapsulated, we get a slow delivery, which also we would think should cut down on the irritation profile of both drugs.
So this drug as the fixed combination was studied in acne patients who are age nine and up who had moderate to severe acne. They were treated once a day, every day for 12 weeks, and we compared it to the vehicle alone. It's always important to look at baseline characteristics because we wanna make sure that the patients who are studied in any clinical trial really mirror the type of patients that we see in our offices. And what we find is the, uh, the mean age was about 20. We find that it was a little more female in this study than male, a good distribution by ethnicity. The majority of these patients had moderate disease, about 10% was severe, and they have a pretty high lesion count, including both the inflammatory and the comedonal lesions. How did this drug do? Well, first of all, we have two sister studies that are conducted, and the reason we do that is we wanna make sure that we have good reproducibility of the data. Can we believe the data that we see in one study and get similar results in the second study. And the first thing we notice is that both of these studies were statistically superior in terms of achieving treatment success as compared to the vehicle. We start to see separation with wider separation at week 12. Here's an example of a patient who uh, came in. And remember, these patients use this drug just as monotherapy, one fixed combination once a day for 12 weeks. And we see a nice reduction um, here in both the inflammatory as well as the non-inflammatory or the comedonal lesions from baseline to week 12. Here's another patient who has a lot of activity, especially on the temples and the central face. And when we look at this patient, again, we see a nice improvement using this drug by itself once a day for 12 weeks. Now, this is a patient that's kind of interesting because when this patient, if this patient walked into my office, I probably would not be thinking about using a topical therapy as monotherapy. <clears throat> I'd probably be thinking about giving this patient a systemic agent and probably think about um, enrolling this patient in the, in the eye pledge program for oral isotretinoin. Yet when we look at the fixed combination for this patient as monotherapy, we actually get a nice reduction. This patient didn't get all the way to clear, almost clear, but we can see that this fixed combination really did pull its weight in getting this patient pretty much under good control. Okay, so what about the side effect profile? Basically what we found was uh, nearly all of the adverse reactions were either mild or moderate. There were no treatment related serious adverse reactions. And uh, overall, this is a nice option in that with that slow delivery and deliberate delivery over time, we seem to minimize the irritation profile. And this just shows the irritation over time, we start to see actually an improvement and patients did better um, at the end of therapy than they did when they came in at baseline. So what else do we have? Well, we have something that's really kind of interesting. We have a triple combination. And what does that actually mean? Well, we have actually completed phase three clinical trials of the first triple combination which utilizes clindamycin phosphate, 1.2%, benzoyl peroxide, 3.1%, and adapalene, 0.15%. And you might say, oh, come on, honestly, why do I need a triple combination? Why should I even care about what we see with this particular triple combination? And this drug was studied in a really interesting way. You know, when you have when you have a fixed combination with two things, you have to study the fixed combination, the, the duad versus each of the monads and the vehicle. But now we have three. So how are we supposed to study this? Well, in the phase two study, we actually had five arms. We had this triple combination in one arm. We had the vehicle in one arm. And then we had the pairings of each of the two combinations. We had benzoyl peroxide and adapalene fixed combination in one arm, clindamycin benzoyl peroxide in another arm, and then clindamycin adapalene in another arm. So that's a lot of combinations. And what we're trying to show is that the triple combination is statistically significant not only to the vehicle, but also to the duads. And you can imagine that can be a really tough challenge. After phase two, if it does well, they would go on to see the fixed combination. And this time you really only have to compare it to the vehicle alone. 
And remember with the phase three studies, we always do two sister studies to make sure we have good, believable data. So what did we find in the phase two studies? Well, I think this is a really fascinating study. The dark blue line is the triple combination, and then we have the, the, the dual combinations in the next arms, and then the, the black um, bar is the, the vehicle itself. And we see that the triple combination is a little bit easing out the other four arms, but look at week 12. Week 12, we have 53% of patients getting to clear or almost clear, which they started with moderate to severe disease. So by definition, that's a two, a three, or a four grade improvement. What I also find fascinating is when you look at how the, the duads um, did, we see that each of the dual combinations actually performed fairly similar in a similar way. That means each one of the individual ingredients is pretty much pulling its weight to have efficacy in the treatment of the acne. But we also find that if each of the duads was about 15 or 16% efficacy, the triple actually outperformed what we would have expected to see had we just added up the efficacy of the individual ingredients. Here's an example of a patient um, at baseline with pretty significant moderate acne, and by week 12, a nice improvement with just some residual macular erythema. So how did the phase three studies do? Because remember, we finished um, the phase two study, and now we go on into the phase three study. And what we found was the phase two is listed here. We saw up to about 52% of patients getting to clear, or almost clear. In the phase three studies, we found very similar efficacy. About half of the patients who came in with moderate to severe disease using this drug as monotherapy, this fixed combination, as its own treatment once a day, we're getting about half of the patients to clear, or almost clear. And in terms of treatment efficacy, especially for a topical agent, this is the highest treatment efficacy of any of the topicals that I've seen from clinical trials. So does it work for the inflammatory lesions as well as the comedonal lesions? And the answer was yes. Basically, we found that up to 80% reduction of the papules and the pustules by week 12 from the phase three studies and also for the comedones, we had about a 73% reduction in comedones by week 12. What about tolerability? You know, we're putting three of these acne drugs together in one fixed combination. What are we going to find in terms of tolerability? And actually, with the three together, um, we expect to see somewhat of a, a bit of a tolerability issue, especially when it has a retinoid and a benzoyl peroxide, but I think the tolerability profile was better than we would have expected. Most of the treatment emergent adverse events were mild or moderate, less than 4% discontinued due to any adverse reaction uh, related to, to tolerability, and the mean scores were, were actually fairly good, less than mild on average. So, we talk a lot about trying to get our oily skin under control. And when you go online and you look at the blogs, there are a lot of different ways to get that oil under control. If you listen to the bloggers, you've got to use the right cleanser and the right moisturizer. But is that actually true? You know, and, and what about using a topical retinoid? I know when I put a retinoid on, it dries out my skin. Is that actually reducing the sebum production? And the answer is no. Topical retinoids actually don't decrease sebum production. They can dry the skin and they're comedolytic, but they don't affect the sebum production. And the truth is, it doesn't matter how you cleanse or moisturize, you're not going to affect your sebum production. In fact, when we look at our topical agents, we can normalize follicular hyperproliferation, we can decrease inflammation, we can kill that C acnes, but we have never been able to topically put on a product that reduces the sebum. We can do it with oral hormonal agents, we can do it with oral isotretinoin, but we hadn't been able to do that topically. And that's true until now. Now we have clascorderone, and clascorderone is a, a drug that actually competes with androgens or dihydrotestosterone at the level of the sebaceous gland 
And um, it's been shown, at least in vitro, to actually when we compete and we block that, that androgen receptor, we've been shown to decrease sebum production, decrease the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and decrease that whole inflammatory pathway. When we look at the structure of class cordyrone, we would expect it to be similar to dihydrotestosterone because that's what it's competing with for the androgen receptor. And also notice it's very similar to the structure of spironolactone. So this drug was studied in phase three clinical trials, looking at patients with moderate to severe acne. They did study patients all the way down to um, age 9 in the clinical trials, although it, it did get FDA approval for age 12 and up. This drug is a BID drug, using it twice a day in the clinical trials as compared to vehicle, and we did an evaluation at the end of 3 months or 12 weeks. After that point, we did an open-label long-term extension study which is really a safety study where we're looking to see if there's any new red flags, new safety issues that come up when we have access to this drug over the course of the rest of the year. And in this study, patients were also allowed not only to just treat the face, but they could treat the trunk or the back. And the way this long-term study was conducted was similar to other long-term studies. Patients treat their skin until they get to clear, almost clear, and then they go off drug and they continue off drug until their skin gets worse again to mild disease or, or worse and then they go back on drug. So patients were then evaluated um, at different time intervals over the course of the year determining whether or not they needed to go back on the active medication. So how did this drug do? Well, the goal is to get to clear, almost clear with a two grade improvement. And we saw that both of the, of the clinical trials achieved that goal. We saw up to about 20% of patients got to clear, almost clear <clears throat> with that two grade improvement. We also analyzed both the inflammatory lesions and the comedonal lesions, and we found a statistically significant difference in both types of lesions. In terms of the irritation profile, what's interesting about this drug is it really was well tolerated. And when you look at the class cordyrone on the left and the vehicle on the right, and you look at the, the irritation profile, really not a, a lot of difference between the active drug and uh, the vehicle itself. Then in terms of the long-term safety study, again, where patients had active, um, had access to the drug for up to the entire year, we found that there were no new safety signals that uh, were seen over the long-term use. Most of the treatment emergent adverse events were mild, and the most frequently reported one was nasopharyngitis. In terms of safety and tolerability, we found that this drug was actually well tolerated, not only on the face, but also on the trunk. And this is a nice option for truncal acne because it doesn't cause bleaching of the clothing or the um, of or bed linens or anything else. So it's something that could easily be used on the body without a problem. And here's an example of a patient who has, I think we can appreciate some inflammatory lesions and some comedonal lesions. And then here he is at week 12. And again, this is something that can be used not only on women, but also used on men. And here's a frontal view with some definite inflammatory lesions and we see a visible improvement by the end of 12 weeks. So what else is new? Well, what about treating acne just once a week? Would that be something kind of crazy? What about if we utilized a drug that came from a sponge? And this all sounds kind of crazy, but actually there is a once weekly topical that was derived from a freshwater sponge. Um, it, this is thought to have both an anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial properties, and this has been studied and is in current uh, <clears throat> clinical trials for both acne and rosacea. So it's ground down, it makes this little paste, you put this on, you, you mix it with hydrogen peroxide, apply it, leave it on, wash it off, and it's done just once a week. And what we found was with this once weekly treatment, 
we actually saw a statistically significant difference in getting to clear or almost clear, and we saw a nice reduction in both the inflammatory and the comedonal lesions. So again, this is something that has been looked at for both acne as well as rosacea. <clears throat> And finally, what else is new? Well, we have a laser that was just recently FDA approved for the treatment of the acne. And this is a laser that tends to target the 1726 wavelength. This wavelength is important because it's more selective for the sebaceous gland. And when we look histologically at what happens when we target the skin, we can see that the laser targets the sebaceous gland and we start to see necrosis of that gland. But when we look at the surrounding skin, the surrounding skin seems to stay intact. So that's quite interesting that we can actually target the sebaceous gland, try to take those glands out and keep the rest of the skin looking healthy. And this was studied in some preliminary studies. Patients had between one and three treatments, anywhere between three and four weeks apart. And we found that uh, the responder rate was about 90% of getting some kind of a response. We found that almost 50% of patients had at least a two grade improvement in their acne and they came in with either mild, moderate or severe acne. And about a third of patients uh, got to clear or almost clear. 87% um, of the patients were quite satisfied with this type of a treatment. There is another study that has, has pretty much uh, finished up at this point, again, looking at mild, moderate, or severe, um, anywhere from age adolescence to age 60, um, looking also at counting the <clears throat> inflammatory lesions as the primary endpoint, but also looking at secondary measures, including the um, comedones and the number of patients getting to clear, almost clear. So that's another option for those patients, especially somebody who doesn't want to take um, a, systemic, a systemic medication who has significant inflammatory acne. So we're going to go ahead and switch gears and now talk about what's going on in rosacea. Are there any new developments? And there all have been a lot of new developments in rosacea. Uh, first of all, let's just talk about what happens with the skin barrier when we have rosacea. What do these patients actually look like? And what we find is the skin barrier actually has is significantly diminished. We know that these patients have severe dryness of their skin. They have an elevation of their pH and their barrier is defective and that means we have an increase in transepidermal water loss and a decrease in the hydration levels of the skin. When we look at the barrier alterations, we find that these abnormalities that creates a skin barrier dysfunction is actually very similar to what we see with atopic dermatitis patients. So the rosacea in the atopic derm patients might be much more similar than we originally had thought. Now, just to kind of take a step back and look at the pathogenesis of acne and take a look at where some of our medications fit in, we know that rosacea at its core is an inflammatory disease and we have abnormalities of the cathelicidin pathway at its core. We also know that we have neurovascular dysregulation and that leads to the sensitivity of the skin, the vasodilatation, and ultimately the telangiectasias. And if we want to get rosacea patients under control, we tend to mix and match our medications to hit different aspects in the pathogenesis and try to get the inflammatory areas under control, the background erythema under control. And we really have to kind of look at the patient as a whole, decide what are the signs and symptoms that I'm seeing in this particular patient and how am I going to reach the best endpoint. I want to look for a minute at LL37, and that is a peptide that is produced by the cathelicidin pathway. And what we know in the in a normal response for the um, antimicrobial peptides in the cathelicidin pathway in particular, we normally have a precursor uh, molecule, a cathelicidin precursor, and there's an enzyme KLK5 that breaks off, cleaves off a little piece of that, and this gives us this important peptide called LL37. So what does this peptide do? It actually is very important in innate immunity. It's chemotactic, it's mainly bactericidal, and it has a limited inflammatory range. 
However, when we look at rosacea patients, these patients pathway is not as normal. In fact, we have too much of the precursor molecule KLK5. We end up having too much of the enzyme and we have too much of LL37, but it's not normal. This peptide is not normal. As opposed to being mainly bactericidal, it actually has much more um, potent in, uh, pro-inflammatory effects. And so how do we know that? Well, again, we'll go to a mouse model. And in this mouse model, they took LL37 from a normal patient and they injected it into the skin and they really didn't find any type of a pro-inflammatory response. However, when they took that same peptide from rosacea patients and injected it into the skin, we actually saw the signs and symptoms of rosacea. So we know something's going funny with that particular molecule. So when we think about rosacea, I talked about the pathogenesis. I didn't talk about any bacteria being central to the pathogenesis of, of rosacea. So why are we so fixed on using antibiotics? What are the antibiotics doing for the rosacea patient? Well, it's important to note that for the tetracycline family, which is the antibiotic family that we use most traditionally to treat rosacea, these antibiotics have significant non-antibiotic properties. We know that they can inhibit neutrophil migration and chemotaxis, which can decrease inflammation and oxidative stress. We know that they can decrease matrix metalloproteinases, which can decrease dermal dest uh, destruction, inhibit angiogenesis, so we can kind of inhibit that abnormal vasculature and they can inhibit the pr uh, production of LL37. And that, again, would decrease all of these inflammatory changes that we see. So when we think about antibiotics, we're really not using them, them for their antibacterial properties, but for their other properties. So what antibiotics are we using now most frequently? Well, we'll turn to minocycline. And minocycline had always been used as a systemic medication, but more recently we found it was effective and well formulated in a 1.5% foam formulation. This had been studied in moderate to severe papular pustular rosacea. These patients were treated once a day over the course of 12 weeks. Again, we have two sister studies that are conducted. These are conducted the same way, active drug versus vehicle. These patients had a lot of inflammatory lesions at baseline. We treated them every day for 12 weeks. And then we went into an open label safety study that lasted for the rest of the year. And again, the, the reason we do these long-term open label studies where everybody gets access to the drug is we wanna make sure that there are no safety signals that are identified when you have access to this drug over long periods of time. This was a rosacea study. It was studied only in adults. They had to have moderate to severe disease between 17, 15 and 75 papules and pustules, um, and they did have to have a history of, of redness or flushing. So looking at the demographics of who came into the study, we see it was a typical rosacea uh, group that came in. The age was around age 50. It was more female than male. It was more white than other ethnicities. And when we look at the number of inflammatory lesions at baseline, we see it's about 30 lesions. And that's a lot of lesions at baseline for either even a topical or a systemic medication. So how did this drug do? Well, first of all, again, we see the studies both hit their endpoint. We saw a statistically significant improvement in getting these patients with moderate to severe disease all the way to clear or almost clear with at least a two grade improvement. And we see about half the patients or more got to this endpoint. We see the patients did fairly well with a vehicle also, but we remember that the vehicle can add significantly to the efficacy of the overall drug, especially when we're talking about a vehicle that has important barrier repair elements. Now here's some examples of patients. This first patient came in with moderate disease. At the end of 12 weeks, they are completely clear. Really nice result. This next patient is a treatment failure. They came in with moderate disease and they only got down to a mild, but it looks like a visible difference, but it's not a treatment success in the eyes of the FDA. Here's another uh, treatment success, moderate disease at baseline. 
can see a lot of irritation of this patient. And by the end of week 12 and almost clear, here's a patient who had severe disease at baseline. She had a three grade improvement from a severe to an almost clear. So these are really visible changes using this drug as monotherapy once a day. What about the adverse reactions and the treatment emergent adverse reactions? This is something I, as an investigator and as a medical dermatologist, I was concerned about. When we put high concentrations of minocycline directly on the skin, my main concern was, am I going to see minocycline-induced hyperpigmentation? What I found, first of all, was the drug was very well tolerated, not that much different from the vehicle itself, and I did not see any minocycline-induced hyperpigmentation. We didn't see that in the clinical trials, not for the rosacea, not for the acne, and any hyperpigmentation that did occur, especially in the one patient, was deemed to be post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. This, um, this drug was studied long-term, as I mentioned, so those patients who completed the phase three clinical trials had the opportunity to enter into the open-label study, and the bottom line was the majority of the treatment at emergent adverse events were mild or moderate. There was no new safety signal that developed over the course of the long-term studies. So what else do we have? Well, we're talking about minocycline, so let's talk a little bit about a new oral minocycline. This is an extended release minocycline that has been studied in a phase two study in two different concentrations. The first concentration was 40 milligrams extended release. The second concentration was 20 milligrams extended release. This was studied over the course of uh, 16 weeks and they didn't study it just compared to placebo. They actually use an active arm here. And the active arm is the one oral antibiotic or the submicrobial dose doxycycline 40 milligram capsule that's already FDA approved for rosacea. So it was an active comparator, two different um, concentrations of the enterocoded minocycline and the placebo itself. And if you look at the graph, we start to see a, an early treatment a difference at week four and the dark purple line really holds its lead all the way through uh, the end of the study. And we see at week 16, it was better not only than the vehicle, but also better than the lower concentration, the 20 milligrams, and the already FDA approved um, uh, submicrobial dose doxycycline. So this minocycline does appear to be highly efficacious, Six, almost two thirds of patients getting to clear or almost clear with that two grade improvement. Well, what about using something else topically for rosacea? Is it possible to use benzoyl peroxide to treat rosacea? And I'll tell you right now that if you told a patient with rosacea to go to Target and get a benzoyl peroxide and put that on their face to treat their rosacea, you would get a really bad review. They would say, what does this person know about treating rosacea, they gave me something that just burned my skin tremendously. And that's true. And when we look at the rosacea guidelines that have been published by a number of different rosacea groups, benzoyl peroxide is not listed as any type of a first or second line treatment for rosacea. And the main reason is it's just not tolerated. Well, now we have a, a benzoyl peroxide, as I talked about with acne, with the fixed combination, we also have benzoyl peroxide as a just a, a single element. Um, and this is also encapsulated in the silica shells. So we have benzoyl peroxide, which is wrapped in silica shells, and it's just a, a single treatment drug, and it has been studied for the treatment of moderate to severe rosacea. Now, the difference is when you take the benzoyl peroxide from Target and you put it on your skin, you kind of get a dump of benzoyl peroxide directly on the skin that can cause significant irritation. So whether or not it works, nobody's gonna know because they're gonna stop using it after th the first dose. However, the microencapsulated benzoyl peroxide gets that very slow delivery of benzoyl peroxide over time, and you don't reach that threshold for irritation. So this drug was studied, active drug as compared to vehicle, every day for 12 weeks. It was studied in adults who had at least 15 inflammatory lesions, two or less nodules, with moderate to severe disease. 
And what we found was this drug also was highly effective in getting rosacea under control. Again, we see up to 50% of patients getting to clear or almost clear using this drug as monotherapy, one thing once a day over the course of 12 weeks. We see that the drug starts to kick in fairly rapidly. We see it starts to separate by week two and continued improvement over the course of the 12 weeks. What about irritation? And what's interesting about this drug was the irritation profile was really unique and this drug was well tolerated even from the beginning of use. Patients tolerated this drug. At our center, we had nobody who complained about any type of a tolerability issue over time. Here's an example of a patient and we can watch this patient's journey over the course of their 12 weeks. They came in with severe disease and notice by just two weeks, they're considered to be cleared up of their inflammatory lesions. Um, so a nice improvement by week two. We're gonna look to see also how well is this drug tolerated? Do we see an increase in erythema at two weeks? In fact, we see a decrease of perilesional erythema in this patient. They're chugging along pretty well week four and week eight. They had a little bit of an outbreak, which can happen. And so at the end of 12 weeks, they went from a severe down to an almost clear, and that is definitely a treatment success. Here's another patient who had severe disease at baseline. We see them at week two and we can visibly see a change. They went some, from severe to a moderate. Week four is still a little bit of a breakout. By week eight, they're still considered moderate. By week 12, they have a few lesions, especially on the chin. They are not a treatment success because they still have mild disease, even though they had a too great improvement. Look at week 12 as compared to baseline. I think that's a noticeable difference using just a topical treatment once a day for rosacea. So what else do we have? Well, we're gonna go back to one of our um, our old friend, saracyclin. And saracyclin is an oral antibiotic that's FDA approved for the treatment of acne. What's nice about saracyclin is it has a very potent anti-inflammatory profile. It's a narrow spectrum of action in that it doesn't hit the gram negatives. So narrow spectrum, very nicely anti-inflammatory, FDA approved for acne, other things we know about saracyclin are that, for instance, in an animal study, we found that saracyclin does not cross, cross the blood-brain barrier, unlike minocyclin. So we don't expect to see the CNS side effects that we see with, with minocyclin, and that's been uh, true in clinical trials. So is this a drug that we could potentially use for rosacea? Well, this was a um, investigator-initiated trial, a small study looking at 100 patients who uh, treated their moderate to severe rosacea either with oral serocyclin, weight-based dosing, or a vitamin, treating every day for 12 weeks. And what we found was this drug was actually highly effective in getting the rosacea under control, which isn't surprising because we know tetracycline drugs have fairly potent anti-inflammatory properties. Serocycline might have the most potent of the anti-inflammatory properties, so it wouldn't be surprising that this drug should work well for rosacea. And in this small study, we found that about 75% of patients got to clear, almost clear, compared with 16% who were taking just the vitamin. When we look at the side effect profile, minocycline is generally probably the best tolerated of the oral tetracycline family. We see a small amount of GI side effects um, and not we don't see the uh, CNS side effects that we might expect with a minocycline drug. So another question I have now, is it possible to modify the course of rosacea if we treat up front, can we change the course? And that's something that we've kind of asked and we've looked at with oxymetazoline. So let's just talk a little bit about what is oxymetazoline again. This is an alpha adrenergic agonist. It binds to the, uh, the alpha-1 receptor and it causes it to vasoconstrict. When it does that, it squeezes out the blood, it vasoconstricts, it squeezes out the blood and decreases the background erythema that we can see associated with rosacea. So this was a study looking at oxymetazoline as monotherapy for the treatment 
the background erythema of rosacea. Patients applied this medication every day for 52 weeks. So you wake up in the morning, you apply it to a clean face, and you just put it on once a day, but you do it every single day, whether you're going out, whether it's Sunday, whether it's not. And the issue is sometimes people will use this medication only if they have to go out, if they're going to work that day, if they're working from home, they might not want to use it. And the question is, should we use it on a PRN basis the way a lot of people do? Or is this the medication that we should be using on an ongoing basis every day? And so the question is, if we do use this every day, does this potentially change the course of the disease? So let's take a look here. So at baseline, we're looking to see how many patients got um, a success, a, a too great improvement in their background erythema. So at day one, you see pre-dose, nobody did. They all had to have some moderate or severe erythema at baseline, and 11.6% achieved it at hour one, and 17.8% achieved it at hour, at, uh, hour six. But after they had been using the drug for four weeks, there were a few people who came in and didn't have the significant background erythema that they had when they started. And we also start to see that more people are responding to the oxymetazoline, more patients are getting that, that too great improvement. Um, and that has to match both the investigators and the subjects. Then at week 26, we start to see, well, you know what? Even more patients are responding and now 6.5% of patients are coming in with, a, with an improvement in their background erythema. And at the end of a year, we find that 11.2% of patients don't have that background erythema at baseline anymore that they had when they came into the study. And we also find that more and more patients are actually responding to the oxymetazoline um, over the course of the day that we didn't see so well at day one. And when we look at what does this actually look like, well, here's the first patient, the woman on the left. We see her at baseline. Um, and at day one, you know, she has some redness. When we look at her before she puts on her medication at week 52, maybe her nose is a little less red than it was um, when she started out. But look at the gentleman on the right. When we look at him at predose at baseline, he has some definite rosy cheeks before he starts any medication at all. And then we see he has a nice improvement by hour six. But after he's been using the medication for an entire year and he comes in in the morning, he's, you know, wakes up and he's getting ready to put on his medication, he doesn't even have much background erythema at all at the pre-dose. And we see hour two and six, again, he's probably getting a little bit of a response from the medication, but he actually has a different background erythema at day 52 than he had at week one or day one. So the question is, are we actually changing the course of the disease? Is it less likely that they'll develop some of the sequelae of rosacea if we control the blood flow and we vasoconstrict up front? I think the answer is still out, but there is some a little bit of data that says maybe that is the case. So the bottom line is, I think we have a really, really bright future in both acne and rosacea. We have a lot of new tools in our toolbox, and we have a very active pipeline for treatment. And I think that you know we need to be sensitive to, to our patients' needs. We need to realize that we greet the world with our smile and our, our face and our complexion. And it's very important to our patients that we get their skin under control and keep it under control. So be aggressive about getting control early on, be aggressive about keeping control. When we still see those red marks or those brown marks, we know this can potentially turn into atrophic scars. We wanna treat aggressively up front. We wanna to continue to treat aggressively in our rosacea patients. We have the tools now to get more and more patients all the way to clear, almost clear. So our patients should demand more and we should demand more for our patients. So it's an exciting time. I look forward to what's on the horizon in the years to come. And I hope I've given you a few kernels of truth to take back to your practices. So thanks so much for joining me today.